Chapter Ten of Peeps at People, being certain papers from the writings of Anne Warrington Witherup, by John Kendrick Bangs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April Walters, AprilWalters.com. Peeps at People, Chapter Ten, The Dureshkas. On my return to London. I received a message from my principals at home suggesting that, in view of the possibilities of opera next winter, an interview with the famous Brothers Dereshka would be interesting to the readers of the United States. I immediately started for Warsaw, where, I was given to understand, these wonderful operatic stars were spending the summer on their justly famous stock farm. I arrived late at night and put up comfortably at a small and inexpensive inn on the outskirts of the city. Mine host was a jolly old Polander, who, having emigrated to and then returned from America, spoke English almost as well as a citizen of the United States. He was very cordial and assigned me the best room in his house without a murmur or a tip. Anxious to learn how genius is respected in its own country, I inquired of him if he knew where the Dereshkas lived and what kind of people they were. Oh, yes, he said. I know them Dereshkas very well already. They have one big farm on their hills. I gets my butter and eggs from those Dereshkas. Indeed, said I, somewhat amused. They are fine fellows, both of them. Yes, he said. I like them well enough. Their butter is good, and their eggs is good, but their milk is always schemed. I do not understand it why they should scheme their milk. I presume, said I, that their voices are in good condition? Well, he replied, I don't know much about their voices. I don't ever speak to them much. When I saw them lost, they could make themselves hurt. But, you know, they don't need their voices much already. They keep a man to sell their butter and eggs. But, of course, you know that they are renowned for their vocal powers, I suggested. I don't know much about them, he said simply. They go away for a year or two every six months, and they come back meet plenty of money, of one kind and another. But I suppose they all made it out of butter and eggs. What is those vocal powers you is talking about? Is that some new kind of chickens? I gave that landlord up as a difficult case. But the next day, when I called at the castle of the two famous singers, I perceived why it was that in their own land they were known chiefly as farmers. The Dereshkas, said I, as I entered their castle, some ten miles out of Warsaw, and held out my hand for the brothers to clasp. It was a superb building, with a facade of imposing quality, and not, as I had supposed, built of painted canvas, but of granite. To be sure, there were romantic little balconies distributed about it for Jean to practice on, with here and there a dark, forbidding casement which suggested the most base of Edouard's bass notes. But generally the castle suggested anything but the flimsy structure of a grand opera scene. Their reply was instant, and I shall never forget the magnificent harmony of their tones as they sang in unison. Miss Witherup? Miss Witherup? they inquired. The same, I sang, and I haven't a bad voice at all. We are glad, sang Jean in tenor tones. We are glad, echoed Edouard, only in bass notes. And then they joined together in, We are glad, we are glad to see you. I wish I could write music so that I could convey the delightful harmonies of the moment to the reader's ear, particularly that last phrase. If a typographical subterfuge may be employed, it went like this, To see he he he. Start on C and go a note lower on each line, and you will get some idea of the exquisite musical phrasing of my greeting. Excuse me, Jean, said Edouard, but we are forgetting ourselves. It is only abroad that we are singers. Here we are farmers and not even utilists. True, said Jean. Miss Weatherup, we must apologize. We recognized in you a matinee girl from New York and succumbed to the temptation to try to impress you. But here we are not operatic people. We run a farm. Do you come to interview us as singers or farmers? I've come to interview you any old way you please, said I. I want to see you at home. Well, here we are, said Edouard, with one of his most fascinating smiles. Look at us. Tell me, said I, how did you know I was a matinee girl? You just said you recognized me as one. Easy, laughed Jean, with a wink at his brother, by the size of your hat. Ah, but you said from the United States, I urged. How did you know that? Don't English matinee girls wear large hats? Yes, returned Edouard with a courteous bow, but yours is an exquisite taste. 
Just then the telephone bell rang, and Jean ran to the receiver. Edouard looked a trifle uneasy, and I kept silent. "'What is it, Jean?' Edouard asked in a moment. "'It is a message from the Countess Ponatowska. She says the milk this morning was sour.' "'Those cows must have been at the green apples again,' replied the tenor moodily. "'It's very annoying,' put in Edouard impatiently. "'That stage carpenter we brought over from the Metropolitan isn't worth a cent. "'I told him to build a coop large enough for those cows to run around in, "'and strong enough to keep them from breaking out and eating the apples, "'and this is the third time they've done this. I "'Really think we ought to send him back to New York. "'He'd make a good target for the gunners to shoot at over the Navy Yard.' "'What are the prospects for Grand Opera next year, Mr. Dureshki? I asked, after a slight pause. "'Pretty good,' replied Jean absently. "'Of course, if the milk was sour, we'll have to send another can over to the Countess.' "'I suppose so,' said Edouard. "'But the thing's got to stop. "'I don't mind losing a little money on this farm at the outset, "'but when it costs us fifteen hundred dollars a quart to raise milk, "'I don't much like having to provide substitute quarts when it sours "'at sixteen cents a gallon, "'just because a fool of a carpenter can't build a cow coop "'strong enough to keep the beasts away from green apples.' I had to laugh quietly, for, as the daughter of a farmer, I could see that these spoiled children of fortune knew as much about farming as I knew about building lighthouses. Perhaps, I suggested, it wasn't the green apples that soured the milk. It may have been the thunderstorm last night that did it. That can't be, said Jean positively. We have provided against that. All our cows have lightning rods on them. We bought them from a Connecticut man who was here the other day for five hundred dollars apiece. So you see, no electrical disturbance could possibly affect them. It must have been the apples. I suppose I had better tell Blancon to take the extra quart over himself at once and explain to the Countess, said Edouard. Blancon here, too? I cried in sheer delight. Yes, but it's a secret, said Jean. The whole troop is here. Blancon has charge of the cows, but nobody knows it. I wouldn't send Plasson, he added, reverting to Edouard's suggestion. He'll stay over there all day singing duets with the ladies. One had asked Salchi to attend to it. She's going to town after the turnip seed this morning, and she can stop on her way. All right, said Edward. I imagine that will be better. Plancon's got all he can do to get the hay in, anyhow. Edward looked at me and laughed. We are hard workers here, Miss Weatherup, he cried. And I can tell you what it is. There is no business on earth so exacting and yet so delightful as farming. And you are all in it together, I said? Yes. You see, last time we were all in New York, we were the most harmonious opera troupe there ever was, Edouard explained. And it was such a novel situation that Jean and I invited them all here for the farming season and have put various branches of the work into the hands of our guests, we two retaining executive control. Delightful, I cried. Melba has charge of the dairy and does a great deal of satisfactory rehearsing while churning the butter. You should hear the spinning song from Faust as she does it to the accompaniment of a churn. Magnificent. And you ought to see the little Rossitano and Cremonini rounding up the chickens every night while Bauermeister collects the eggs, put in Jean, and Plasson milking the cows after Morel has called them home, and that huge old chap Tamango pushing up the lawnmower up and down the hayfields through the summer sun. Those are the sights even the gods rarely witness. It must be a picture, I ejaculated with enthusiasm. And Ancona? Is he with you? He is. And he's as useful a man as ever was, said Edouard. He is our head ploughboy in Calvage Vegetable Garden. Well, Jean and I do not wish to seem vain, Miss Witherup, but really, if there is a vegetable garden in the world that produces cabbages that are cabbages, and artichokes that are artichokes, and Bermuda potatoes that are Bermuda potatoes, it is Calvage Garden right here. And what becomes of all the product of your farm, I asked? We sell it all, said Jean. We supply the Tsar of Russia with green peas and radishes. The Emperor of Germany buys all his asparagus from us. And we have secured the broiled chicken contract for the Austrian court for the next five years. And don't you feel, Mr. Dureshka, I asked, that all this interferes with your work? It is my work, replied the great tenor. Then why, I queried, do you not take it up exclusively? Singing in grand opera must be very exhausting. It is, sighed Jean, it is indeed. Siegfried is harder than haying, and I'd rather shear six hundred sheep than sing Tristan. But, alas, Edouard and I cannot afford to give it up. For if we did, what would become of our farms? 
the estimated expense of producing one can of peas on this estate miss wetherup is three hundred dollars but we have to let it go at fifty cents asparagus costs us fourteen dollars and eighty cents a spear a lamb chop from the dereshka lamry sells for sixty cents in a paris restaurant but it costs us ninety seven dollars a pound to raise them so you can see why it is that my brother and i still appear periodically in public and also why it is that our services are very expensive we didn't want to take the gross receipts of opera the last time we were in new york and when the company went to the wall we'd gladly have compromised for ninety-nine cents on the dollar had we not at that very time received our semi-annual statement from the agent on our farm showing an expenditure of eight hundred thousand dollars as against gross receipts of one thousand six hundred fifty dollars sixteen hundred and thirty dollars said edouard correcting his brother we had to deduct twenty dollars from our bill against queen victoria for those pheasants eggs we sent to windsor three crates of them turned out to be shanghai roosters true said jean i had forgotten i rose and after presenting the singers with the usual check and my cordial thanks for their hospitality prepared to take my leave you must have a souvenir of your visit miss witherup said jean what shall it be a radish or an alderney cow they both cost us about the same thank you i said i do not eat radishes and i have no place to keep a cow but if he will sing the long run and farewell for me it will rest with me forever the brothers laughed you ask too much they cried that would be like giving you ten thousand dollars oh very well said i i will take the will for the deed we'll send you our pictures autographed said edward how will that do i shall be delighted i replied as i bowed myself out you can use them to illustrate the interview with jean called out after me and so i left them i hope their anxiety over their crops will not damage their folkler bowers as the landlord called them for with their voices gone i believe their farm would prove a good deal of a burden end of chapter ten recording by april walters Chapter 11 of Peeps at People, Being Certain Papers from the Writings of Anne Warrington Withrop, by John Kendrick Bangs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Peeps at People, Chapter 11. Henrik Sienkiewicz. On my way back from the Polish home of the Dereskes, it occurred to me that it would be worth while to stop over a day or so and interview mr sienkiewicz there were a great many things i desired to ask that gentleman and he is so comparatively unknown a personality that i thought a word or two with him would be interesting i had great difficulty in finding him for the very simple reason that like most other people i did not know how to ask for him ordinarily i can go into a shop and ask where the person i wish to see may chance to dwell but when a man has a name like sienkiewicz the task is not an easy one when it is remembered that poets in various parts of the united states have made the name rhyme to such words as sticks fizz and even vichy it will be seen that it requires an unusually bold person to try to speak it in a country where words of that nature are considered as easy to pronounce as jones or smith would be in my own beloved land however i was not to be daunted and set about my self-appointed task without hesitation my first effort was to seek information from my friends the dereskes and i telegraphed them where can i find sienkiewicz please answer with their usual courtesy the brothers replied promptly we don't know what it is if it is a patent medicine apply at any apothecary shop if it is a vegetable we do not raise it but we have a fine line of parsley we can send you if there is any immediate hurry i suppose i ought not to give the brothers away by printing their message of reply but it seems to me to be so interesting that i may have hoped to be forgiven if i have erred i next turned to the bookshops but even there i was puzzled most of the booksellers spoke french and while i am tolerably familiar with the idiom of the boulevards i do not speak it fluently and was utterly at a loss to know what quo vadis might be in that language 
so i asked for a copy of with fire and sword avez-vous avec fou et sabre i asked of the courteous salesman it may have been my accent or it may have been his stupidity in any event he did not seem to understand me so i changed the book and asked for the children of the soil n'importe said i avez-vous las enfants de la terre excuse me madame he replied in english but what do you want anyhow i want to know where uh, where the author of quo vadis lives oh said he i did not quite understand you it is so long since i was in boston that my american french is a trifle weak if you will take the blue trolley car that goes up ujadovska avenue and ask the conductor to let you off at the junction of the krakowski persedmieski and the novi sviat the gendarme on the corner will be able to direct you thither great heavens i cried would you mind writing that down he was a very agreeable young man and consented it is from his memorandum that i have copied the names he spoke with such ease and if it so happens that i have got them wrong it is his fault and not mine one more thing before i go said i folding up the memorandum and shoving it into the palm of my hand through the opening in my glove when i get to er the author of quo vadis's house whom shall i ask for i fear the young man thought i was mad he eyed me suspiciously for a moment that all depends upon whom you wish to see he said i want to see uh, him said i then ask for him he replied it is always well when calling to ask for the person one wishes to see if you desired to call upon mrs brown jones for instance it would be futile to go to her house and ask for mrs pink smith or mrs green robinson i know that said i but what's his name the young man paled visibly he now felt certain that i was an escaped lunatic i mean how do you pronounce it i hastened to add oh he replied with a laugh and visibly relieved oh that why sinkevich of course it is frequently troublesome to those who are not familiar with the polish language it is pronounced sinkevich s i e n k sink i e a w i c z vich sinkevich and so i left him no wiser than before he did it so fluently and so rapidly that i failed to catch the orthopedic curves involved in this famous name armed with the slip of paper he had so kindly handed me i sought out and found the trolley car conveyed by signs rather than by word of mouth to the conductor where i wished to alight discovered the gendarme who turned out to be a born policeman and was therefore an irishman who escorted me without more ado to the house in which dwelt the man for whom i was seeking is uh, the head of the house in i asked of the maid who answered my summons i spoke in french and this time met with no difficulty the maid had served in america and understood me at once yes ma'am she replied and immediately ushered me into the author's den where i discovered the great man himself scolding his secretary i cannot understand why you are so careless he was saying as i entered in spite of all my orders repeatedly given you will not dot your j's or cross your l's if you do not take greater care i shall have to get some one else who will write this letter over again then he looked up and perceiving me rose courteously and much to my surprise observed in charming english miss withrop i presume yes said i grasping his proffered hand how did you know i was at the Dureskas when your telegram reached there yesterday he explained we thought you would be amused by the answer we sent you oh said i seeing that i had been made the victim of a joke it wasn't polite was it oh i don't know he replied 
it was inspired by our confidence in your american alertness we were sure you would be able to find me anyhow and we thought we'd indulge in a little humor that was all ah i said smiling to show my forgiveness well you were right and now that i have found you tell me do you write or dictate your stories i dictate them he said wonderful said i can you really speak all those dreadful polish words they are so long and so full of unexpected consonants in curious juxtaposition that they suggest barbed wire rather than literature to the average american mind i had a sort of sneaking idea that he would find in juxtaposition a word to match any of his own and i spoke it with some pride he did not seem to notice it however and calmly responded one gets used to everything miss witherup i have known men who could speak russian so sweetly that you'd never notice how full of jays the language is said he and i have heard englishmen say that after ten years residence in the united states they got rather to like the dialect of you new yorkers and in some cases to speak it with some degree of fluency themselves what is your favorite novel mr er uh, sinkevich he said smiling over my hesitation thanks said i gratefully but never mind that i have a toothache anyhow and if you don't mind i won't don't mention it he said i won't i answered what is your favorite novel quo vadis he replied promptly and without any conceit whatever he was merely candid i don't mean of your own i mean of other people's said i oh said he i didn't understand still my answer must be the same my favorite novel in polish is of course my own but of the novels that others have published i think quo vadis by jeremiah curtin is my favorite of course it is only a translation but it is good i did not intend to be baffled however so i persisted very well mr er you said i what is your favorite novel in chinese my favorite novel has not yet been translated into chinese he said calmly but i had to admit myself defeated do you like vanity fair i asked i have never been there said he simply what do you think of pickwick i asked that is a large question he replied with some uneasiness i thought but as far as my impressions go i think he was guilty i passed the matter over are you familiar with american literature i asked somewhat said he i have watched the popular books in your country and have read some of them and what books are they i asked well quo vadis and the prisoner of zenda he replied they are both excellent i suppose you never read conan doyle i put in with some sarcasm a man who is familiar with what is popular in american literature ought to have read conan doyle yes he replied i have read conan doyle i've read it through three times but i think dr holmes did better work than that his autograph on the breakfast table was a much better novel than conan doyle and his poem the charge of the light brigade is a thing to be remembered still i liked conan doyle he added everybody does i said naturally it is a novel that suggests life blood insight and all that said my host but of all the books you americans have written the best is mr thackeray's estimate of your american boulevardier it was named if i remember rightly tommy fadden i read that with much interest and i do not think that mr thackeray ever did anything better though his story of jane eyre was very good indeed fadden was such a perfect representation of your successful american and in reading it one can picture to oneself all the peculiar qualities of your best society really i am grateful to mr thackeray for his tommy fadden and when you return to new york 
i hope you will tell him so with my compliments i looked at my watch and observed that the hour was growing late i am returning to paris said i so i have very little time left still i wish to ask you two questions first did you find it hard to make a name for yourself very said he it has taken sixteen hours a day for twenty years then why didn't you choose an easier name like lang or johnson i asked what is your other question he asked in response when i make a name i make a name that will be remembered sinkevich will be remembered whether it can be pronounced without rehearsal or not what is your other question are you going to read from your own works in america or not dr doyle dr watson anthony hope matthew arnold and richard le gallien have done it how about yourself i asked mr sinkevich sighed i wanted to but i can't said he nobody will have me nonsense said i have you they'll all have you but he added how can i one must be introduced and how can chairman of the evening introduce me they have intelligence said i and some of them have so i was quite right yes but they have no enunciation or memory said he i can explain forever the pronunciation of my name but your american chairman can never remember how it is pronounced i shall not go and so i departed from the house of mr sinkevich i can't really see why when he was making a name for himself he did not choose one that people outside of his own country could speak occasionally without wrecking their vocal cords like one boggs for instance End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of peeps at people being certain papers from the writings of anne warrington withrup by john kendrick bangs this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jenny clements peeps at people general whaler upon returning to my london lodgings i was greatly rejoiced to find awaiting me there a cable message from the war department at washington saying that if i would visit general whaler at madrid and secure from him a really frank expression of his views concerning our spanish imbroglio the president would be very glad to give me a commission as first assistant viviandier to the army of the philippines with rank of captain i saw at once that endeavouring to secure an interview with this particular celebrity i ran risks far greater than any i had yet encountered greater even than those involved in my visit to mr kane at his manx home it is my custom however to go wherever duty may call and inasmuch as my sex has since the days of joan of arc secured military recognition nowhere except in the ranks of the salvation army i resolved to accept the commission and notified the war department accordingly fortunately my style of beauty is of the spanish type and furthermore when at boarding school many years ago in brooklyn i had studied the spanish tongue so that disguise was not difficult i had seen carmencita dance at a private residence in new york and had therefore some slight knowledge of how a full-fledged senorita should enter a room so that on the whole i went to madrid tolerably confident that i could beard the great spanish lion in his den and escape unscathed purchasing a lace mantilla and a scarlet scarf about eight feet long my feet covered with red slippers and a slight suggestion of yellow silk hosiery peeping from beneath a satin skirt of the length prescribed by the rainy day club and armed with a pack of cards and a pair of castanets i ventured forth upon my perilous mission nothing of moment occurred on the journey i did not don my spanish dress until i had left england behind indeed i had reached the pyrenees before i arrayed myself in my costume although i was most anxious to do so it was after all so fetching once in spain i had no difficulty at all and in fact made myself very popular with the natives by telling most charming fortunes for them and dancing the armadillo and opadilla dock with a verve which pleased them and surprised even myself i have always known myself to be a resourceful creature 
but I had never dreamed that among my reserve accomplishments the agility and grace of a premier danseuse could be numbered. It was Friday evening when I reached Madrid, and Saturday morning, bright and early, I called at General Whaler's house. A rather stunning bandolero opened the front door and inquired my business. "'Tell General Whaler,' said I, "'the Signorita Gypsy del Castanelos de Sierra de Santiago of Newark, New Jersey, wishes to speak with him on affairs of national importance.' I had resolved upon a bold stroke, and it worked to a charm. The general, who was mortally afraid of assassins, had been listening from his usual hiding-place behind the hat-rack. Pushing the hat-rack from before him, he stepped out into the hall, and standing between me and the door, inquired threateningly if Newark, New Jersey, was not one of the dependencies of the United States. I answered him in fluent Spanish that it was, told him that I had lived there through no fault of my own for three years, had had to fly before a mob because of my pro-Spanish sympathies, and travelling night and day, had come to lay before him a complete sketch of the fortifications of Newark, together with the ground plan of Harlem, which, as I informed him, he would have to take before he could possibly hope to place Washington in a state of siege. I also gave him a chart showing by what waterways a Spanish fleet could approach and reduce Niagara Falls to ashes, a blow which would strike England and the United States with equal force, without necessarily altering the status quo ante with Great Britain. The general, like the quick-witted soldier that he is, became interested at once, the lowering aspect of his brow cleared like the summer clouds before an August sun, and with an urbanity which I had not expected, invited me to step into his sanctum. I accepted with alacrity. I cannot say that it was a pleasant room. It was in military disorder. Machetes and murderous-looking pistols were everywhere, and the chair to which I was assigned was a pleasant little relic of the Inquisition, and was so arranged that had the general so wished, the arms holding hidden iron spikes would fold about me at any moment, and give me a hug I should not forget in a hurry. Added to this was a series of Kodak pictures of all the atrocities of which he was guilty while in Havana. These were framed in one massive oaken frieze, running from one end of the room to the other, and labeled on a gilt tablet with black letters, Snapshots I have snapped, or pleasant times in Cuba. This demonstrates that Whaler is one of those rarely fortunate people who take pleasure and pride in the profession they are called upon to follow. General, said I, once we were seated, did it ever occur to you that if you were two feet shorter and clean-shaven with a different nose and a smaller mouth and a shorter chin and a bigger brow and less curved your arms when you walk, you would resemble Napoleon Bonaparte? The general was evidently pleased by my compliment. Do you think so? said he, with a smile which absolutely froze my soul. "'I do,' I said meekly, and then I began to weep. I was really unnerved, and began to wish I had never accepted the commission. He was so frightfully cold-blooded, and toyed with a stiletto of razor-like sharpness, so carelessly that I was truly terrified. "'Don't cry, Gypsy,' he said. "'War is a terrible thing, but we will beat those Yankee pigs yet.' This, of course, was before peace was declared." The remark nerved me up again. He believed in me, and that was half the battle. "'Oh, I hope so, General,' I sobbed. "'But how? Poor old Spain has nothing to fight with.' "'Spain has me, Signorita,' he cried passionately, "'and I single-handed will give them the battle.' "'But you do not know the country, General,' said I. "'Don't risk your life, I beg of you, our only hope. "'I haven't a doubt that in a fight with pigs you will win. "'But, General, the United States is so vast, so complicated, it's full of pitfalls.' I could see that I had worked him up. Signorita, he cried, fear not for Wela. Think you that I do not know America? Ha, ha! I know it's every inch. And let me tell you this. It is because I have devoted hour after hour, day after day, night after night, to the study of the United States. And best of all, they do not suspect it over there. Why? Because of my strategy. When I wished to learn where was situated the city of Ohio, did I send to New York for a map? Not I. I knew that if I bought a map in New York, the house of which I bought it would advertise me as one of the patrons. I am too old a Spaniard to be caught like that. Here his voice sank to a whisper, and leaning forward he added impressively, I sent for a railway timetable. Figures expressed to my mind with lines or maps could not express to others. What did I learn from the New York Central timetable, for instance? This. Ohio is twelve hours from New York. 
good, say you. But what does that mean? Traveling at the rate of four miles an hour, Ohio's just 48 miles from New York City. 48 miles! Pah! By forced marches, our troops could cover that in ten days. The general snapped his fingers. But why Ohio, general? I asked. The most important city in the American Union, he replied. Ohio captured, we have the home of McKinley. Ohio captured, we have captured 80% of the Yankees' public officials. Your minister of state comes from there. All the vocal powers of the Senate, all their political resource. Ah, he cried ecstatically, rubbing his hands together. They little know me. Let them destroy our navy. Let them take the Philippines. Let them blockade Cuba. Let them do what they please. Spain will wait. Spain will wait a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade, a century. But when least expected, a new fleet built secretly, a new army, recruiting now on the DQ, this is a translation, will dash into New York Harbor, up the Missouri River, through the Raritan Canal, and Ohio will lie at our mercy. And then, said I, overwhelmed, We'll hold Ohio until the pigs give back the Philippines and Cuba, said the general suavely. No, General, said I, pursing my lips. Your plan is a mighty good one, and I hope you'll try to put it through. But let me tell you one thing. Your timetables have misled you. In the first place, any part of Ohio worth talking of is 18 hours from New York by rail, not 12. New York Harbor is mined all the way from Fortress Monroe to the Golden Gate, and you can't go to Ohio by a dash up the Missouri River and the Raritan Canal, because those two waterways above Los Angeles are not navigable. It is very evident that you, in studying a railroad map, have forgotten that they are designed to advertise railroads and have no geographical significance whatsoever. Are you sure? he asked. Perfectly, said I. I have lived in the country, as I have told you, for three years, and I know what I am talking about. And what shall I do to attack Ohio? he demanded. Well, said I, the question is not easy to answer, but I think if you would first caption Hoburnkin, yes, said he, making a note of my suggestion, and then take your transport scouted by your fighting ships out as far as Rahway, I continued. I have it here, said he, putting it down. Land your troops there and send a hundred and fifty thousand south to Bangor and a hundred thousand north to Louisville, Kentucky, with a mere handful of sharpshooters to overawe the Seminoles at Seattle, and then let these troops close in, said I. I understand, said he, enthusiastically. If you will do that, I put in, you'll come as nearly capturing Ohio as any man can come. The general rose up and excitedly paced the floor. Senorita, he said at length, you have done your country a service, but for you my plans would have all fallen through. "'because, based upon the unreliable information put forth "'upon an ignorant people by corrupt railway officials, "'I have studied with care every railway map "'issued in the United States for ten years past. "'I had supposed that Ohio could be reached "'by way of the Missouri and the Raritan. "'I had supposed that to bring about the fall of Nebraska "'were their immortal general, "'for I admit that those pigs have occasionally produced a man. "'O'Brien lives. "'It could be attacked by a land and sea force simultaneously.' Should the land forces approach the city from the Chicago side and the fleet pass the forts at Galveston and sail up Chesapeake Bay without further molestation, I see from what you have told me that these maps are fossils in uno, anyhow. I am wondering now if they are not fossils in omnibus. I shouldn't be surprised if they are even fossils in trolleybus, I put in, with a feeble attempt at humor. Certainly they have misled you, General. But, he cried angrily, I am not to be thwarted. My ultimate idea remains unchanged. On to Ohio is my watchword. When that falls, the rest will be easy. Thanks to the information you have given, I now know how it may be done. And I assure you, senorita, that you will not be forgotten in the, ah, uh, the... Here his sallow features grew animated, and a flush of real pleasure crossed them as he finished. In the, ah, uh, reorganization. There is to be a reorganization, then, I asked. Yes, he answered. That is certain, and on the whole, it is good that there is to be. People are always pleased with that which is novel. And up to this time, there have been no kings on the throne bearing the name of Valeriano. I think Valeriano I will make a very pretty autograph, don't you? Indeed I do, I cried. Write one for me, won't you? But the sagacious warrior merely winked his eye, and by a swish of his machete courteously gave me to understand that the audience was over. I immediately cabled to Washington the results of my interview, 
and by the time I got back to London, had the pleasure of reading in the newspapers that the United States Senate had confirmed my appointment of first assistant Vivian Dier to the Department of Manila with the rank of captain, for services rendered. Wherefore, I have given up the pleasant task of interviewing celebrities for the sterner duties of war. I was glad also to learn that the administration, acting upon my advices, had taken steps to make Ohio impregnable by sea in any event. The Gibraltar of American politics should not be allowed to fall into the hands of a ruthless Castilian like Whaler. And frankly, whatever else our government will permit, I do not think it will ever do this. And as long as we possess Ohio, we need have no fear that we shall be governed by foreign people. End of chapter 12 End of Peeps at People, being certain papers from the writings of Anne Warrington Withrop by John Kendrick Bangs.